Good morning, everybody. My name is Ignacio Ramirez. I'll be your moderator for this morning session. And welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a school, and it is not a church. It either be affiliated with a church or a religious organization. This school is a non-profit, non-denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of the eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity unto this present day. Now this school is the result of a divine panoramic vision and revelation given to Henry Clifford Kennedy in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. And we established schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. Archetype Pattern Workshop was established in February 2021. Now in these schools, we use and teach by the true and original names and titles of the Heavenly Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been properly substituted by the Lord. The true title for the Word of Son is Elohim. It has also been properly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. We now know that each Lord must have a name, each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title for the life Lord of God. Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound as made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such things as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and written name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Now Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in this pure spirit state on this chart as a cloud. Now Yahweh is not a cloud. He really chose the cloud to symbolize itself, because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We draw this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right with himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. And this shape and form can only be seen in a divine vision and understood in divine revelation. Later on, the self-same spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walk the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, who the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plain? 
A further understanding of this statement title can be had by reading the preface of the Holy Day Bible. Also in this school, we teach the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. Throughout the Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. And he instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth to this school to prove that everything in the universe moves and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now the ten aims of the school are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh or all of him as it really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate queer and superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, or Satan, and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And the eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained, there was no other name given among men whereby man can be saved save in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watchers, peace, our slogan, speak the, speak the truth. Uh, this morning I'm prepared by Dr. Irene Ramirez. Our scripture lesson is Ephesians, the second chapter. Our scripture reading will be Dr. Annette Ramirez, and we'll have a selection of music after the prayer. morning and good afternoon. We like to come together and ask Yahweh our Elohim to grant us some more knowledge, understanding, wisdom, patience, and um, please need the understanding so we get on in this world. And we ask this in your son's name, Yahshua Messiah. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Good evening, class. Good morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. <laughs> I can't hear myself. I think it's off. Here it is. Good morning, class. My name is Annette Ramirez, and I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testament, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.P. Trainer. I'll be reading Ephesians, the second chapter. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespass says, and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, and now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our deportment in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But Yahweh, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with the Messiah, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Yahshua the Messiah that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Yahshua the Messiah. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of Yahweh, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Yahshua the Messiah unto good works, which Yahweh hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye be, being in time past heathens in the flesh, who called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without the Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Elohim in the world. But now in Yahshua the Messiah, ye who formerly were far off are made nigh by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto Yahweh in one body by the cross, having slain the en enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the sons, and of the household of Yahweh, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yahshua the Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple unto Elohim, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of Elohim through the Spirit. I have read Ephesians, the second chapter. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks again and uh, good morning. Uh, last week uh, there was a symposium out in uh, Florida. Uh, Unity and uh, Yah. Hmm? Unity and Yah in Orlando, Florida. 
And, uh, well, we couldn't make it, but we did have a member go down there, uh, my daughter Nanette. And hopefully she enjoyed herself. I know she did and enjoyed the classes. So I'm going to ask her to come up and give a report. Chicago um, and to the Dean of Chicago branch and he um, spoke about well, the topic was um, what matter of persons ought, ought you be but he kind of um, started off with what matter of person might you not ought to be or not ought be so I, I kind of um, took to that because what he was saying was, um, he brought us back to Moses and the law. Um, we're not supposed to, we were never supposed to be doing any of these laws here, or cardinal ordinances. Um, and this is not what we ought to be doing. And we know in different religions throughout the world, you know, they have millions of members, they believe that they still need to do these. And, or they believe that they, the law was given to them, which we know it was not. It was only given to the Jewish people or Hebrew people at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so, we can go ahead and start with, um, I believe it was in Exodus, when the law was given, when um, um, Elohim was talking to, I believe, Moses. I, I believe it says, this is from memory, um, that he will make a law with them, and they will be his people. So we have to remember when we go back, he's talking to the Hebrew people, not to the future people that are non-Hebrew, that are non-Jewish. He's not talking to the Gentiles. Are you he, talking about Je <coughs> Jeremiah 31, 31? Is that what you're we, we can. I, I think it's, um, yeah, it's throughout there. I think um, it gets recalled there. Or repeated there. It's been another one in Colossians or something like that. I just remember him talk, telling Moses that. Um, okay, let me. I'll read Jeremiah 31 okay. 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. But this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inner parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their Elohim, and they will be my people. Okay, go ahead and stop there. So the part where he says, you know, they break the law and I was a husband. And well, we know that, you know, Yahweh spoke the law down. And it was it was 
a wedding. They, he married the Israel, um, Israelites or the Hebrew people. Um, so that's why he said he was a husband and a tenant, because he provided for them. And um, now when it started off, it said that he will uh, make a new covenant, which will be um, one written in our hearts and minds, and that's spirit. It's not anything physical, nothing physical that um, we have to do. Um, is there anything else you want to continue? I mean, 34. Okay. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know ye Yahweh, for they shall know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh. For I will, for, for I will forgive their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more. Okay. There's one in Exodus Go 6 ahead. and 7. Go ahead and read that one. Exodus 6 and 7. Exodus 6 and 7. And I will make you to... And I will take to you, to me, for a people, and I will be to you an Elohim. And ye shall know that I am Yahweh, your Elohim, which brings you out, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Okay. So we need to ask us, who is he, what people are he, is he talking to? Who is he talking about? He's talking about the Israelites, the Hebrew people that he brought out of Egypt. So go ahead and say, continue to say, he'll give them a law. Mm -hmm. I'll restart reading. And I will bring you unto a land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you an heritage. I am Yahweh. And Moses spoke unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of the spirit and for cruel bondage. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Okay, that's when he speaks to Pharaoh. Okay. So I think it's when um, he tells them to gather around the mountains. I don't want to say it's just around there. To oh. clean themselves up and gather. Oh, 19, I think it is. Because he's going to speak to them. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Exodus 19 and 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone out of the land of Egypt, the same day came into the wilderness of Sinai. For they departed from Rephidim, and did come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mountain. And Moses went up unto Elohim, and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall I say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Chapter 11. 11. And be ready against the third day, for the third day Yahweh will come down in the sight of all people upon Mount Sinai, and shall set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourself, that ye go up not into the mount, or touch or the borders of it. Whomsoever touches the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not a hand touch, but it shall surely be stoned and shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpets sound long, they shall come up into the mount. And Moses went down from the mount of the people, and sight of the people and washed their clothes. Okay. Uh, 16. And they came to pass on the third day of the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out to the camp to meet with Elohim. And they stood at the foot of the mount. And the Mount Sinai was altogether a smoke, because Yahweh descended on it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as a smoke of the furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and Elohim answered her by the voice. And Yahweh came down the Mount Sinai on top of the mount, and Yahweh called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up. 
And Yahweh said unto Moses, Go down, charge people they break, that they break through unto Yahweh to gaze, and many of them perish. Okay. Somebody want to walk? I want where he tells Moses what he's, what, why they're gathering, why are they gathering here at the mount? Because, well, he said, I will speak to you. Right, that, that's what I was looking for. Sure right there. Um, okay, so we know that they gathered in the mountain nuts um, when they they trembled in their fear, in fear of, of Yahweh because of the loud um, thunderings and, you know, that was, that was a very scary sight for them. So they had Moses um, nine. be their intercessor. Read nine. Do you want to try nine? Nineteen and nine. Okay. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Continuing on, um, well, I'll have to find that, that scripture and bring it up um, at another time. Um, so um, Moses comes down, and this is his, um, let's see. Um, so this is when the law is given to mm -hmm. the children of Israel and not to any Gentiles. I didn't hear anywhere where it said Gentiles. Um, in, in the scriptures it says, you know, um, Jacob and the Israelites, which means the Jewish people, and not any Gentiles um, or Egyptians. He did not give the law to any Gentiles. Um, and therefore, you know, we, out in the world, we know coming to this class that we are not to be doing any type of these, any, any phys physical workings or anything for our salvation. Um, it's just not, it's not, it wasn't given to us. And it's, it's not even um, valid any longer for the um, Jewish or Hebrew people because our Savior um, died on the cross and that abolished all of that. He, he finished all of that. He fulfilled all of that. So even if you're Jewish and you're still practicing these laws, it's still wrong. Um, now, that's what I um, might take away also from the symposium. Um, there are other speakers also um, that you know spoke about you know what ought to be and and then you know the message ending with to love thy brethren and that's where we should be. Um, because again, I, I I can't. I try to look for a transcript where, because I've heard um, various speakers say that Dr. Kinley said we're going to need each other towards the end, um, or the founder said that. So I'm trying to look for something where it says that because I haven't I haven't found it yet. So um, I'd like to yield the floor and thank you for your time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, I remember some sayings too that uh, people would say, Dr. Kinley has said, he says, towards the end, they're going to be knocking down your doors to come and listen to this teaching, you know, because it's going to be that bad. So, okay, without further ado, our next speaker would be the uh, uh, director of uh, work, uh, Archetype Workshop, uh, Dr. Will Williams. Great. And all. 
colossal, colossal, stupendous, Iranian <coughs> Christian revelation given to us by Yahweh and Elohim. Okay? And I appreciate what the first person had to say. And I'm going to kind of uh, segue into some thoughts I had that I'll think about what I might want to go into. But unless somebody has something truly, truly present, you know, you can bring it up if you like. Otherwise, I'll just continue on where the last speaker left off. Anything? Going once, going twice, something that I've got. Because hopefully I, I may get to in my discourse. Now, all right. <laughs> uh, Ezekiel 36 and uh, 24. This is just like going on with what she said after. Okay, let's, let's read that script. She, she was going into it, then she went off. Because, like, what we're supposed to be doing. Um, uh, what we're like not now. supposed to be well, What they're not, and then what we're supposed to be doing at yeah. the end. Ezekiel, what, 36 and. 20. Twenty-four. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. That's good enough. I mean, that's what you were trying to point out. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of people get confused on that because the way the scripture reads, she just read, it says, I will take away your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. Go, Wait a minute, I don't, I don't want a fleshly heart, I don't want a spiritual heart. No, that's you're not understanding the metaphor. Mm -hmm. See, this is the stony heart here. Because remember the Ten Commandments? He was in the shape of a heart. When Moses came down the mountain, so it was in the shape of a heart. So I would give you, a, I'll take away this stony heart and give you a, a heart of flesh. What I'm saying is, I will give you a heart that is alive. Mm -hmm. See, because your, your heart is beating while it's in your flesh. Right? That's the metaphor. See, I'll take away this stony heart, one that is dead or has no life in it, mm -hmm. and I will give you a heart of flesh. One that is alive, that is beating, that is pumping blood. Because the scripture says the life is in the blood. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. Now, we'll segue from that, and we're trying to get into a more general picture here. Because what first people talked about was that law, those 613 ordinances. Now, there was a time when there was no 613 ordinances, okay? All right. All right. Now, Back here, in the antediluvian age here, all right, there was no Ten Commandment Law, 613 ordinances. Well, in fact, Moses' law didn't come until 2,513 years after the transgression. Okay? And see, and there's a reason for this, and, and I want to kind of get into this thing about human government because see that's what the law talking about the law of Moses was really was supposed to be about a way to govern you and your actions right now the reason why the law was Moses was given in the first place let's read it it's Galatians 3.16 Galatians 3 and 16. Now to Abraham and his seed was a promise made. He said not to seeds, plural, but to seeds, singular, mm -hmm. which is his Messiah. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before you of Yahweh in his Messiah, the law, which came 430 years after cannot disannul that it should be made the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be by the law, it is no more by promise, but Yahweh giveth to Abraham by promise. 
Wherefore then serveth the law? All right, now he's asking the question. Now, what purpose then serves the law? And the law he's talking about is the 613 ordinances that was given to Moses and the Israelites on Mount Sinai. So what serves the law? Right. We... Wherefore then serves the law? Where, wherefore then serves the law? I mean, in other words, what purpose right. does the law serve? What's right. the purpose of this law? We... It was added because of transgression. It was added because of transgression. It was at, because of that. See, go ahead. To the seed should come to whom the promise was made. To the seed should come of whom the promise was made. See, the promise was made, oops, to Abraham, that through his seed, singular, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Yahshua is the fulfillment of that seed. He is of the seed of Abraham, of that promise. Mm -hmm. And then through his death, burial, resurrection, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, see, the Jews were brought in. Mm -hmm. Seven years later, the Gentiles were brought in. See, promise fulfilled that was given to Abraham. That's why we say you are saved by grace through faith. Because that's what that's what he, that was the dispensation in which Abraham operated under. Right. Abraham was given the promise of that. That was the dispensation of faith. Okay? Now, is there anything else in there? It says, and, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. It was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right? Now, okay, now that's. With, with Israel, all right? Now let's go back to the world in general because we did start off back here, all right? With Cain. That's where I want to start there because I could really start this thing back up in the, in the heavenlies because there was a war in there, right. yeah. see? And, and when we talk about government, you see, government is simply, well, what does the word government mean? That this, this means to govern, mm -hmm. see, to govern, to to have control over one's actions, behaviors, etc. Okay, so back here in the age of in the antediluvian age, which we call the age of conscience. Now, this back here, <clears throat> boy, I, 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 I want to. To a proper introduction, because I, I have somewhere where I want to go, but but if I don't introduce it properly, I won't get there. We read the scripture in Galatians about about the transgression. Right. Okay. Let me use this here. This is the creative age that I was at showing that I was back there with the age of dispensation chart. This is the creative age. Just prior to the transgression here, all right. This is in a day of eternity, or in a type, all right. So when the transgression happened, man's consciousness began to go down. That's reflected by the S U N because it's going down, it's right. sundown. In other words, you know, after it was all said and done, Elohim dealt with the man and the woman for touching and eating of the fruit. They were cast out of the garden. They were literally cast into the outer darkness. They were cast out of the creative age right. and into the antediluvian age. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's what I'm trying to show here as an illustration. The antediluvian age here began in darkness. And here they are out here. You know, there's the spirit, see, at the, at the edge of the garden, showing them the egress. Here's the water. See, he's sweating by the face, you know, his face because he was told he had to work for his land. Then 930 years later, he died a physical death. He died a spiritual death up here, but 930 years later, he died a physical death. But this is the antediluvian age, okay? Then he had children, Cain and Abel. Cain, as I'm just cutting the story up, he killed his brother, and in time he was cast out, and a mark was put on him. And he built a city. I may as well. I need to. While you're back there, 
I want the, it's a 16, it's the one with Cain, Clayton Cain, I want that one. 14? No, 14. Is it 14? No, 14. Uh, oh, oh, you know, that's an a angelic transgression. I think it's a 13. Yeah, you get, I, I'll take it. I'll take it. 13, 14. I want 14. I want 16. Uh, and, and the Tower of Babel. May as well just get this trifecta in here if I can just get a foundation. Then when I get to where I want to go, hopefully it'll make some sense. Okay. Let me have one chart. One in your hand. Yeah, that one. Mm, and to the, yeah, that's Kane. Yeah, I want that one. Okay. All right. That's the we're, 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 we're doing good. We're cooking with fire here. Cooking with gas. <laughs> Let's see. Six, uh, the, uh, uh, Tower of Babel. So that would be 17. 19, I think. So, <clears throat> while they're doing that, because I hate dead air, get uh, Revelations, the, third, uh, the 12th chapter, and just start reading from there. I'll just read loudly so, so, they, so the camera can pick you up. Revelations 12 chapter. Mm -hmm. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun mm -hmm. and the moon under her feet, and upon her a head of crown, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. It's twelve and one, right? That's twelve and one. Okay, go ahead. And she being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared an another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be de delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Mm -hmm. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto Yahweh and to his throne. And the woman fled unto the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of Elohim, and they should feed her there and uh, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Uh -huh. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world, uh, which he cast out unto the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. Okay. Now, there was war in heaven, and one-third of these angels were cast out. Here we got Michael here with his sword, and here we got Satan here. He's got the mark on him, 666. Mm -hmm. He's cast out, and one-third of that heavenly host is following him out, cast into the ethereal darkness, which is the earth. And see, in the earth, you see here, and see, he's roaming, you know, to and fro on the earth, and he's watching Elohim create you know, this creation sees the earth, it sees the man, see, coming up out of it. And, and as long as, as, and as long, let me, let me come over here. Come up here, let's zoom in here. See, here, here's the man being created. And see, and as long as the man was created, see, he, Satan didn't bother them. See, he didn't bother them. But then once the, once the woman was, was taken out, then Satan comes, you know, he comes on the scene to go on to attack the bride, because that's what he did up here. Spying out, the Spying out their nakedness, see, on the bride, all right? Now, he said there was war in heaven. What kind of war was there? Mm -hmm. Well, Satan just simply tried to set up a government. 
in heaven. He tried to set up his own kingdom because he looked around and he just said, hey, you know, I don't see anybody smarter than me up here. Mm -hmm. I don't see anybody up here more beautiful than I am. I mean, I am radiating glory. I am the son of the morning, you know. And I don't that. I don't see anybody brighter than me, or intelligent, or wiser than me. And Billy Coast, your, your salvation has arrived. And one third believed it. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some folks say that all the angels were saying that two thirds repented. That simply is not so. Right. I can prove that and show that because I have a migratory pattern to look at. And I can see down here. See, when they were in Egypt about Shipra and Pua. See, they were, maybe we should just read that right quick, and I won't drag too long because I do have a, I've got like a 5,000 year journey to make, you know, <laughs> you know, and I think it's the second chapter of, 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 of Exodus. So a third part of the heavenly host fell for it, huh? See, uh... Should I start with chapter two? No, 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 start with one. One and, uh... Um, oh. 15. Okay. Uh, well, none of that is up here. Read 1 and uh, 8. Exodus 1 and 8. Mm -hmm. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Mm -hmm. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Mm -hmm. Come on, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. Okay, good enough. Now, he, he said, a king that knew not Joseph. Now, what he's talking about was, this king wasn't, it, it, it wasn't that he never heard of Joseph. Right. He just simply had no respect for Joseph. See, if you, if you just go back and read Genesis 50 and 19, you're right there. Genesis 50 and 19. Mm -hmm. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for mm -hmm. I am in the place of Elohim. Wait, fear not, for am I, am I in the place of Elohim? Which is yes. He was. He was a type of El Shaddai. Right. All right. But as for you, he thought evil against me. Okay, good enough. Now, oh, oh finish reading that. But Elohim meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. All right, now, he was a type of El Shaddai. Now here comes a, a Pharaoh that didn't know him, that didn't know Joseph, or had no respect for Joseph. See, it's like up here. It wasn't that Lucifer didn't, had never heard of Elohim. He just didn't have any respect for Elohim, okay? And put the people in bondage through his doctrine. Right. See. And then we, now we could read uh, Shipper and Pua, 15. Exodus, yeah, go ahead. Exodus 1 and 15. Mm -hmm. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shipra, and the name of the other was Pua. Mm -hmm. And he said, When ye do the office of midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon their birth stools, mm -hmm. if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. Mm -hmm. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Okay, go ahead. But the midwives feared Elohim. Now the midwives feared Elohim. That, why? Because it's pointing to Michael and Gabriel. Right. See, up here in heaven, see, Lucifer, he's, praying, he's saying, I'm the baddest. I'm the biggest, the best, the brightest, the wisest. All you angels come to me. And so he had got one third. So he's approaching Michael and Gabriel and said, look, you need to bring the rest. You know, you need to bring the rest, you know, under my banner. And they're like, no, we can't do that because we fear Elohim. Mm -hmm. See, the angels, look up here on the Ark of the Covenant. See, they're, they're facing each other, but they're not looking at each other. They're witnessing to the glory, which is Elohim. See, see and then, they're, and they're not going to be deceived because they're, they're witnessing to this glory. Right. All right? That's why I know because in Egypt, Shipper and Pua, they feared Elohim. Lucifer went to Michael and Gabriel, you need to come on my side and bring the rest of the angels with you. And they said, no, we can't do this. We fear Elohim. It's the same thing. It's not, it's not hard. See, you have to see that. And so now they're cast out. And they're going to and fro, seeking whom they may devour. Now man comes along. 
Now we got bodies because see, man, because see these demons who are now demoted, they're consigned to incarnate in the flesh. Right. They cannot take on a physical body and appear, you know. They have to incarnate in the flesh, whereas the righteous angels, see, that's why we have veils here. See, angelic invisibility, see, and then we got the division between invisibility and visibility. When the righteous angels like Michael or Gajah, when they come through this veil, see, they don't have to incarnate in the body. They just come through the veil and they just take on a body. Mm -hmm. They just appear in the likeness of sinful flesh. And you wouldn't know, you know, that was an angel. Now he could look like a bum laying up on the street. You, right. would, you wouldn't know. Or a king or, or you know, a, a sweet, you know, it's just anybody, anything. See, because they, that's the power they have to do that, all right? But now with these unrighteous angels or these demons here who've been demoted, they're going to incarnate in men. See, case in point with Cain here, all right? His conscience is, all right, he goes and he kills um, his brother Abel. See, that's a death, that's murder. His conscience is immersed in wickedness, all right? He's put a mark on him. See, that's like the cup of holy anointing oil. See, in this case, he's anointed right. by Yahweh to be his, to be, to be what he is, to be his demon. Right. And so now here he is in the unholy place, so to speak. And the markers are Cain. Cain and his wife in the land of Nod. Maybe we should read that. Read Genesis, um, the fourth chapter. 415. Genesis 4 and 15. And Yahweh said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, mm -hmm. vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh set a mark upon Cain, lest mm -hmm. any finding him should kill him. Now he set a mark on him. What do you mean he set a mark on him? See, the mark, see, it's right, it's, it's just the same. Look, come over here. Look here. Here. Here's the pattern. First is the altar of sin sacrifice, mm -hmm. where blood is put on the four horns. That's blood. Here we have the brazen labor, which is water. This is where the sacrifices and the high priests were immersed in. All right. Here's the door, all right, the first departmental veil, at which you have the cup of holy anointing oil, which the high priest had to be anointed to be able to do his duties right. here, which is before he goes through the door. At the door, when he goes in. Okay, so he's anointed, to the high priest is anointed to do this job. Likewise, Cain here, see, here's the blood, innocent blood is shed, Abel, all right? Cain's consciousness is immersed in wickedness. That's the brazen labor of the water. Cain has is, 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 is put a mark on him, or he's anointed, where people, you know, he's anointed by Yahweh, you know, in the sense that, you know, this is my personal devil, you know, I will deal with him in my own good time and pleasure, but anybody else, just leave him alone, and I'll deal with him when I feel like it. All right, so that's how you're looking at the pattern being applied on Cain. See, keep reading. And Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh and dwelt in the land of Nod. And Nod, see, that's the land of wandering. That's what the word Nod means. It means going to and fro. See, now Israel followed that phenomenal cloud over here, and, the, and that cloud took them everywhere, <laughs> everywhere in, in the wilderness of Sinai, so, so to speak. You know. In a type wandering, but of course they were following that cloud, but it did take them here and there and so forth, all right? Just like here, all right? Go ahead. Of the east of Eden, mm -hmm. and Cain knew his wife, uh -huh. and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built it a city oh. and C called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. All right, now let's hold it. Now, she conceived. How many weeks does it take for a pregnancy? 40 weeks. 40 weeks. That's the 40 principle on this plate. All right? See, that's the 40 principle. See, you're looking for, in the holy place, the light, the bread, the intercessor. All right? So now, Cain told these people that he was the light, that he was the enlightened one. All right? He said... And the words that he spoke, they were like the bread. Mm -hmm. 
And see, and because of that mark on him, he said, hey, well, look, you know, I got this mark on me. Hey, you know, it was Elohim who put this mark on me. Me, me and Elohim tight, you know. Want me to put in a good word for you? So he pretended like he was the intercessor. Mm -hmm. Now, his, his wife, she conceived and bore Enoch. Now, for her to bear Enoch, that means he has to come through the matrix or the womb, the opening. See, that's the sixth step here. She gives birth to Enoch through the opening. Her matrix has to open. Right. Why? Come over here. What's the sixth step of the migratory path? Jordan River. What did the Jordan River do? Open up. See, you see the point? I'm trying to make this as simple as I can. Mm -hmm. Straightforward. And people will say, well, there's not a lot there to look at. Yes, there is, if you know what to look for. Right. Look for the principles. The manifestations will change, but the principle will always remain the same. Look for the principle. If you understand that, you'll be able to see through the manifestation. Mm -hmm. So now here, she gives birth to Enoch, and that's the opening. And now here we are up here. Here's Cain, and he's looking a lot, lot more better. They're looking a lot better, a lot more prosperous. Up in there. I mean, he looks like a caveman. Yeah. Yeah. But see, up here, see, they're looking a little more prosperous. See, here he was a farmer. He started off as a farmer down here. Mm -hmm. Or as uh, Dr. Kimmy writes, as an agriculturalist. Mm -hmm. And then he turned from agriculture to architecture, architecture and built the city. And now here we have, here he is here on his throne, flanked by his wife and his son. All right? But, you know, pretending to be like he's Yahweh. Why? Mm -hmm. Compare that to the tabernacle. Here's the Ark of the Covenant. So you got two archangels up here and the cloud that led Israel sitting on top of the mercy seat. See, which is that the Ark of the Covenant is the, the throne, is the type of the throne, mm -hmm. the throne of authority. See, and that's what Cain is imitating. See, the, the throne of authority or the law of the spirit manifested in human form. And that's what the devil does. See, now, as we said, this was antediluvian apostasy, and we uh, and I had it over here. I won't move it. The age of conscience. Right. All right. That simply means this: whatever a man thought, you know, was right and he could do and get away with it, that pretty much was it. The law of the land. Like if you stepped on my foot and I picked up a rock and hit you in the head with it and killed you, I figured, well, that's, you know. I had just cause you stepped on my foot, yes. you know, <laughs> or you know, or maybe you know, you know, it could be a thing like you know, I couldn't do that to you, but then I get my family, you know, to jump on your family, yeah. you know. Well, my family, you know, it's like, it's like we used to say back in the old days when we were kids, you know, my dad could beat your dad up, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. you know, you know, where do you think that comes from? Soulless, <laughs> soulless human beings. It's like, yeah, well, you know, and and see and. And here's something else that maybe you should take in consideration. Genesis 6 chapter. Genesis 6 and 1. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, mm -hmm. that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, that mm -hmm. they were fair, mm -hmm. and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is but flesh. Mm -hmm. Let his days be in 120 years. Okay, so now, said the daughters of, of men cohabitated with the sons of Elohim. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think, oh, well, that means that the, the seed got corrupted, because we always say this, that there's 63 generations from Adam to Yahshua the Messiah, okay? But see, here's the thing that people don't understand. There had to be a separation among them. See, because if you remember back up in the garden, go back to the third chapter, I think it's 3.16. Genesis 3.16. Genesis 3 and 16. 
Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy pain. Go back up a little bit, maybe a couple of verses. Um, I want the serpent, but it's, but he's talking to the serpent. Um, we can do 13. So now the serpent more subtle than the... No, no, she's right there. Read. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Where are you at? 13. Go ahead. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, mm -hmm. thou art cursed above all cattle, mm -hmm. and above every beast of the field. Mm -hmm. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Mm -hmm. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now that's the key point. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Enmity is open hatred. Alright, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Keep reading. And between thy seed and her seed. Between thy seed and her seed. That's why when she read Genesis 6 chapter about the sons of Elohim going to the daughters of men. See, look, the sons of Elohim are really the children of Adam. Right. See, because Adam Keep your finger there and, and, and read Genesis 5 and 2, I think 5 and 2 or 5 and 3. Genesis 5 and 2, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam mm -hmm. in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat his son in his own likeness mm -hmm. after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, mm -hmm. and he begat sons and daughters. And he, yeah, and he begat sons and daughters. See, the sons of Elohim, or, or Adam. Because Adam was a son of Elohim. Right. Okay? So now those children, those sons and daughters of Adam, had a choice to make. They could either marry up into Cain's lineage, or they could marry up into Seth's lineage. Because mm -hmm. Seth was the righteous seed. Whereas Cain and his seed, they, they, that was the one that went into perdition, see, upon which the flood was put upon them. Right. Okay? Now, the flood, let's wipe everything away. Here we have the Tower of Babel, which was constructed 101 years after the flood. All right? Here's the satanic foundation of the Tower of Babel. Let's read Genesis 11th chapter. I, I need to hurry up because I, I, really, I got to get to Genesis this. 11 and 1. And the whole time. earth was of one language uh -huh. and a few words. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Mm -hmm. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen, and they were mortar. And they said, Go to let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into the heavens, mm -hmm. and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered lest, abroad. Lest we be scattered abroad. Why would they say that? Mm -hmm. Because that's what happened to them. See, that's those demons talking. That's what happened to them in the flood. Right. Uh, yeah. That's what happened to them in the flood. See, see, the flood drowned out the whole human race, but you can't drown a demon. Mm -hmm. See, so they crossed over from one age into another, and as the human race began to repopulate, then they incarnated it within man again. See, this is what Yahshua was talking about. Um, get your keep somebody get Matthew the twelfth chapter. I think it's 12 and 48 or something like that. Matthew 12 and 48. No, 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 12 and uh, 43. Mm -hmm. 12 and 43. Yeah. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, mm -hmm. he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Okay. Here. Before Noah came, okay, here's the flood. Noah warns the wicked, puts the blood on their heads. All right, here's the water. They're building an ark, and they're working by the sweat of their brow. 
is the spirit, nor is it shown the specifications for the ark. Here they go into the ark, eight souls, all right? See, here's the window here of the ark. That was for the light. That's the light principle. That's like the lampstand. They brought provisions on board, the bread. The Holy Spirit in Noah would be the intercessor. And it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And the windows of heaven were open as well as the fountains of the deep. The windows of heaven being open represents the veils being ripped. Mm -hmm. All right? Then after a year and 10 days, see, they come, the, the ark is found on Mount Ararat, and they come out. Now, before, they, go back, read Genesis 8, well, read 7 and 11 first. Genesis 7 and 11. I'm just trying to get through this so I can get somewhere. Genesis 7 and 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fount fountains of the great deep broken up, mm -hmm. and the floodgates of heaven were opened. Now, and the floodgates of heaven were opened. Now, some Bible says the windows of heaven. Anybody got that verse? Mm, that's the King James. Uh, King, King, King James 7 11. Yes. Read that. 7 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. And the windows of heaven were open. That's the renting of a veil. Uh -huh. Why? Come back over here. Here's the second day of creation. When the waters of the deep, when the waters were separated, the waters of the deep were separated from the waters above, and a firmament was put in the midst. All he did was take away he just read at the veils, and the waters came down, and the waters came up, and mankind was caught in the middle. Okay? All right, now, here, now, read 8, 8 and 16, Genesis. Genesis 8. I mean, that's 16, is it the 13, 13, maybe? Thank you. Genesis 8 and 13. And it came to pass in the 600th year of and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. Mm -hmm. And Noah removed the covering of the ark. Now Noah removed the covering of the ark, but Noah and his family are still in the ark. Uh -huh. Get it? They're still in the ark. Uh -huh. Keep reading. And looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. It was dry. Now, go back to Matthew 12. 43. Now we can understand what Joshua was talking about because he's fulfilling and he's looking back and he's drawing from what Moses and the prophets are saying. Go back and read. Matthew 12 and 43. When mm -hmm. the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. Well, how? Because of the flood. Right. They were cast out because of the flood. You can't drown the spirit. Read. And he walketh through dry places. Yeah, he's walking through dry places because this is his, here's the flood receded. The ark's on top of my era, right? Noah and his family still in the ark, and the earth is dry, and they're walking. See, they can't break into the ark, but they're walking through dry places. Right. Because we just read, Noah said the earth is dry. Mm -hmm. So now these spirits are walking through dry places, seeking rest and finding none because there's nobody out there. Right. They're still in the ark. Get it? Keep reading. Seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house. From whence I came out. Now, see, now, when he said that, he had to wait till they come out of the ark right. and then began to repopulate the earth. See, keep reading. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Empty, swept, and garnished. See, here we are 101 years later after the flood. Read. <laughs> Then he goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. Mm -hmm. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. And that's what's happening here with the Tower of Babel. Okay? See, here's the satanic foundation. Here's the satanic immersion. And we got the word psychological. What do you mean? Because, see, we read that he said that let us make a name for ourselves. In other words... See, in other words, they had water on the brain. Right. They said, well, okay, we got drowned out in the last age, so we'll, we'll get smarter this time. We'll build a tower higher than the mountain. So, that, so if he changes his, look, they had, Yahweh has said, I put my bow in the sky mm -hmm. as a promise. 
and I won't drown the earth out again with water. They saw and looked at it and they said, nah, we don't believe that. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that. Just in case he changes his mind, we'll build this tower higher than the mountain. So if he does change his mind, we'll be, we'll be in this tower and we'll be safe. That was their thinking. They, in other words, satanic immersion. They had water on the mm -hmm. burning. Get it? Okay? So now, go back to 11th chapter of Genesis when you're about the Tower of Babel, when you were reading. And they say, Go to let us build us a city and tower whose top may reach unto the heavens, mm -hmm. and let us make us a name, mm -hmm. lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And Yahweh said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will hinder them from anything they purpose to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So Yahweh scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off building the, the city. All right. Now, I tell people this. This is an ascending plane and a descending plane. Here's how. This is ascending because they're building this tower. They laid the foundation. The satanic immersion. They're going up. The descending part is the spirit law or this thick mist. Because the way Dr. Kim explained it in one of his transcripts, he said it was a thick mist that descended down on the tower over them. And so they were just talking, you know, and like somebody, you know, say, yeah, hey man, pass me a hammer. And the other guys responded like, okay? Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, what are you saying? You know, somebody said, you understand what he's saying? What? And they just started, it was, it was confusion. It was babble. It was babbling, you know, the word, that's where we get the word babble, B-A-B-B-L-E, babble like, you know, the babbling book, or, or somebody who's just going on talking, and just babbling, you know. See, but the word babble, or babel, as the Brits like to pronounce it, B-A-B-E-L, actually, etym etymologically speaking, it means gate. Of right. Hell. See, the word bab, you know, the word bab means gate. All right, so, so. Nimrod was saying he was the gate. This was the gate to L. He was saying he was El. Come on, Nimrod, exalting himself. And look, Nimrod started off as a hunter, and then he became an architect. <laughs> you know, just like Cain over here, he started off as a farmer, and then he became an architect. And then look, he became a priest and a king. Come on, Cain. See, Cain, maybe he was a ruler and he was worshipped. In other words, he was a king and a high priest. Right. It's the same way with Nimrod. Nimrod was a king and a high priest. Good book to read is the Two Babylons book by uh, Reverend Islam. Um, Islam. See, and uh, because it, it goes through, you know, well, see, here, this is where you get all these different religions and, and like, iconography, uh, iconoclastic stuff from here, as well as human government. Because Dr. Kelly put it on the chart, see, Human government, the ideas for human government also comes from here as well, mm -hmm. okay? And see, and it was after Nimrod, you had the, you had the, let's see, you had the Chaldeans, see, here, what we would call the Mesopotamia, you know, the Mesopotamia Valley, the, the, the land between the two, you know, two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. This is where civilization supposedly started from, with the Chaldeans and all. And you, you read about Hammurabi. He came up with the code of law and stuff. Because see, look, here's the thing. Yahweh is the law of the spirit. Right. That controls the universe and every facet of it, including the man. The problem is the man don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And seeing Yahweh set up a purpose and a plan by which to, to show the man how his purpose comes about and how man can be reconciled to that, okay? But see, the problem is, the man as a whole don't understand that because they say, well, if you can't control yourself or you can't govern yourself, we will help you. Mm -hmm. We'll come up with laws. 
that say you can't do this or you can't do that. See, but we'll, and if you and if you break these laws, we'll have deterrence, you know, by which to punish you. See, hopefully that you won't do it again. Okay, all right. And that's, that's how these laws come out, you know, because people would have disputes, you know, like in, in ancient times, you know, like, you know, like, for example, you know, I might have been in my chariot or something, and I ran over a cow or something, you know, and, and you know, and then it's the person who owns the cow, you know, he needed the cow for the milk for his kids and whatnot, you know, and so a good-hearted person would say, well, look, man, I'm sorry, look, I'll, I'll pay for the cow, or uh, I'll give you a, another cow, or... And you go, I got a couple of cows, I'll tell you what, man, I'll give you, you know, a few hundred gallons of milk, you know, or something. You know, you would try to do something for some compensation. However, there were people who were, who were like, I ain't giving you a damn thing. The cow shouldn't have been in my way. And you ain't getting nothing. And if you keep bothering me, I'm going to get you something you may not want. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's how people were. So therefore, disputes had to be settled somehow. You know, and when you talk about government, what is government really? Government is just simply a system by which a group of people will agree upon, you know, as far as their behaviors, you know, what, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Even among homeless people, there is a form of government. Like you, you go into a homeless camp or a, a group of people that's homeless and they have an encampment and they say, yeah, you know, you can hang out with us, but hey, but we got a couple of rules. You can't steal nobody's shoes while they're sleeping right. or, you know, go rifle through their stuff, you know, that kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing, see? And so that's, that's the basis of government is, is really the behavior of people, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Okay, and people have been trying to wrestle that for the longest. They try to, and people have sat down and philosophized about this thing, you know, about how government should be, how people should behave with each other. These, these universal dynasties up here represent various forms of governments that people have tried to attempt, you know, to, to, to exercise in the hope of making whatever they got perfect or run efficiently or something like that, whatever, see, you know, but, but the problem is you'll never satisfy everybody. And, and, and usually, and for what I've seen in most governments, you know, the people who really did well, you know, who got over, you know, they were, they were few compared to the majority who didn't, and many of them in all of these cases were in slavery. Okay, and slavery was practiced in all of these cases, even up to America. See, so you can sit up here talking about, oh, well, we believe in freedom and stuff. But so did they. They said the same thing back here with the Greeks and freedom and democracy, and yet they still had slaves. And then, and, and the Romans, pagan, pagan Rome, they took their cues from, from the Greeks. That's where they got the idea of a republic from. And yet they still had slaves. Because they said, well, yeah, well, you know, we're the, the superior people, you know, we, 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 we're the thinkers, we come up with the ideas, but you guys, you know, you're not that, you're not smart as us, so you gotta, you gotta do the mundane stuff, you know, like take out the trash or clean the latrines and, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, and that's the way it was always, you know, you know, done until, and even, and even with the, um, what we call the, uh, the modern, you know, day, you know, like the industrial revolution. You know, you know, and, and, and machines do take the place of people, but still you got to have people to run the machines. And, you know, and, and really in a lot of cases, the people became just an adjunct to the machines, you know, being run like machines and stuff. So, but, but again, human government, you know, everybody's tried to come up with some sort of system, you know, that would work. And it just isn't, all right? Now, Yahweh, as was pointed out by the first speaker, gave them a law, right. all right? And this law was, look, this law was never meant to save them. I'm talking about those 613. In fact, it never saved anybody. Right. See, people, people died under that law under two or three witnesses. Mm -hmm. That law never saved Anyone, I, I, I challenge anybody to show me where those 613 ordinances saved a soul or saved a person. It says, because, see, if you broke one law, you was guilty of the whole thing. So it was impossible 
for any one person to do it. I mean, someone as wise as Solomon couldn't keep it, you know. Somebody as virtuous as Elijah, he couldn't keep it, right? None of them could. They all fell short. So he had to come along to perform that which they couldn't do. Now, the Gentiles, they see, and look, the Gentiles read the Bible too and draw inspiration from it as well. And many of them drew inspiration from these 613 ordinances to come up with similar things in some cases. Some people did it on their own, you know, come up with similar things based on their religions or their customs and their gods and such. But Yahweh never told them to do that. Okay? Now, I want to get back to the human government thing. How much time I got? Boy, is this short. Okay, now, here. And we've gone through this. Oh, why am I sweating? <laughs> These kingdoms here, this is Nebuchadnezzar's dream that we read many times. It's in the second chapter of Daniel. All right. You just get 17th chapter of Revelations. Revelation 17 and 1. And there came one of the seven angels. Uh, with, go down to uh, maybe 6. Okay. Revelation 17 and 6. And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the sons and with the blood of the martyrs of Yahshua. Mm -hmm. And when I saw her, I wondered with great astonishment. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore art thou astonished? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Mm -hmm. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, mm -hmm. and shall ascend out of the abyss, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life mm -hmm. from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not, and mm -hmm. yet is, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. Now this beast that was, not, that was, which is, and is not. See, in other words, going all the way back. Back here, to the, to the war in heaven. They cast down, they come out, they built kingdoms, incarnated in man. Right. See these, these kingdoms here. See, Babylon, well, I'll, I'll get to it until she reads it. The seven heads are seven mountains. No, on seven the, mountains. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. On which the woman sitteth. Now here's the Vatican, and here's Rome, which does have seven hills, which I truly acknowledge. All right? And it does, and it sits there. However, John is also looking back, because see, John, he's on the Isle of Patmos here. He's looking, he's out here as a witness. He's an apostle, which is what a witness is, and he's looking back. He has seen this thing come all the way down. You know, he's seen it come all the way down because John wrote Revelations. He wrote about the war in heaven. So he saw it coming down, all the way down to where he's at. See, he's seen it, he's seen it, you know, up in the garden, coming on down. He sees it, you know, with uh, Cain, he sees it with Cain here. Sees the flood, what happened to that? He sees the Tower of Babel, what happened? He sees Nebuchadnezzar's dream and these empires that have come down. He's looking at it all of this. Okay, go ahead. And there are seven kingdoms, five are fallen, and one is. Now here's AD 96. Here's John here. He's on the Isle of Patmos. Okay? Now he's on the Isle of Patmos, and he's saying five of these kingdoms are fallen. See, here are the five kingdoms that have fallen. The city of Enoch, Tower of Babel, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks. These five have fallen. Now, I was in a workshop and I kind of brought it up. This is kind of why I'm bringing it up now, so hopefully I can get into it a little more. Because 
Just of, because good question is, well, why isn't Egypt included in this in this list? And I even brought up the idea, well, if you you know, why not the Assyrians? Because they were a great empire too. You can read about Sennacherib and Sargon. They were the ones that took the ten tribes away. Okay. However, Dr. Kinley, this is what I based this on. Dr. Kinley, in one of his lectures, said that Babylon ruled the world twice. First as Nimrod here as the Tower of Babel, the first Babylonian Empire, and again with Nebuchadnezzar, which is the second Babylonian Empire. That's why I include the Tower of Babel in this listing and not Egypt or Assyria. Egypt was, dynast was, was dynastic, they had dynasties, but it was not a universal dynasty, not in the same scope as Babylon or the Medes and the Persians or the Greeks, or pagan Rome, or papal Rome, or not even as the British Empire. Because they, they were an empire too, they were global. You know, I mean, it was said about, about England, the sun never sets on the British Empire, because <laughs> they had colonies all over the place. Okay? What do you have there? And the other is not yet come. Okay, now, these five, now in AD 96, City of Enoch, Tower of Babel, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, Medes and Persians, the Greeks, these five are fallen, and one is. The one is, in AD 96, is pagan Rome. All right, and then it said what? And the other is not yet come. And now, uh, now, the papacy had not yet come, but read. And when it cometh, it must continue a short space. And when it comes, it must continue a short space. And it did. Right. Until 1960. When Dr. Kennedy published his book, God the Archetype Pattern, because it forced the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, into a council. Right. Vatican Council II, which they made many changes in the church. Right. Was that? See, many of these countries still exist, like... Uh, uh, Babylon, it still exists, we just don't call it Babylon, we call it Iraq. The Medes and the Persians, they still exist. You know, Persia, we just don't call it Persia, we just say it's Iran. The Medes, they still exist, we just don't call them Medes, they're called the Kurds. Right? The Greeks, they still exist. Right? Rome, pagan Rome, you know, they still exist, Italy. Paper Rome, the, they, they still exist, but they're not in the height of their glory, like they once were. England still exists, but they're not the British Empire. Not like it was, you know. There was a lady who died, Queen Elizabeth II. She was the one, when she, when she became queen, she was the one that had to oversee the dismantling of the British Empire. That's why, like in the United Nations, you had so many countries after World War II joining the United Nations. These were former colonies, most of them you know, from the British Empire, or from the French, or the Dutch, or the Germans, <laughs> or the Italians. Uh, that's, a, that's another story in itself, how Europe colonized Africa. But, <clears throat> keep reading. And the, and the beast that was, and not is, even he is the eighth head, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. All right. Now that simply means this, since 1960, we, the world, have been living in the eighth satanic kingdom. Right. That simply means this, it is a conglomeration of everything that has come before. The characteristics, and personalities, and accomplishments of these kingdoms are now being highlighted today. Whatever you see back here in the history, you can see it today because everything is now conglomerated. Just like back here, it was the city of Enoch that ruled the world in the antediluvian age. Well, the principle is the whole, because of technology, the whole world is one city now. See, and that city is Babylon. But it will, and really all these different countries now, they're just neighborhoods at this point. Because I mean, I could get on the phone and literally call somebody up around the world, you know. And, and look at them on the phone, you know, like, you know, like we used to watch the cartoons, uh, was it the Jetsons, yeah, you know, you know, and, and really it trips me out because that was like 50 years ago and it was like, you know, 
And, and they even kind of, you know, in a certain, certain way, kind of prophesied the way some things would be, you know, push button, you know, ordering things online. And so back then, we were like, oh, this is crazy. That's the world, you know, but now we see it, you know. It's just like back in, way back in the old days, some of us who could remember, you know, like the comic strip, what was that? Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy, exactly right. Because they had the, the two-way wrist radio watch, you know. But this was back in the 40s they were talking this stuff. Before the television was even, you know, fully developed. They were saying, oh, yeah, we'll have a, a wrist watch, you know, where you can look at somebody and talk to them and that kind of stuff. And they said, wow, that's real futuristic stuff. Well, hey, the future is here now, you know. You know, I'm in this thing. This is just something that tripped me out just not too long ago. Um, this, uh, Janine Whitfield works for this art gallery, and she's got a bunch of us together to try to come up with an idea to, to bring out this three-dimensional art exhibit in Baltimore. And, uh, and she used this uh, AI, you know, it gave you know, intelligence to write up a Correct, you know, like a, a, a summary of what we, you know, what the class, what the the doctrine was about, and 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 we read it. I read it, and I was like, "Hey, I wrote this," uh, and it just tripped me out because it was kind of really accurate, but it was based on what she told it, you know. And they, you know, and it, and it wrote out a summary, pretty much, of what the doctrine was about. And I had to remark, and I remember thinking, I remember saying it. I said, "Wow," I said, "An artificial intelligence." surmising on the intelligence of Yahweh. You know? Yes, ma'am. I really appreciate you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I just thought that was such, you know, I mean, wow, an artificial intelligence writing about the intelligence of Yahweh. And it just, but see, but it's just like anything. It's a program. See, you know, I don't foresee the day where, you know, they're going to become cognizant or somehow develop an electronic soul or something, you know. You know, but then, you know, there are already people joking about it. I used to watch this show called Red Dwarf. It's a British comedy. It's really funny. And about this android. And this android says, well, of course, you know, when we all die, we all go to electronic heaven. You know, and I said, what? And said, yeah, we all go to electronic heaven. You know, this is the place where, where it says that, uh, how do you put it? It says, yeah, yes, when, that, when that great day comes, it says, the, uh, the iron shall lay down with the lamp. <laughs> If you get it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm not worried about artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more worried about the natural intelligence of mankind, you know, as they try to impose their concepts, you know, on you. And that's what they've done, you know. They, they, they've done that. All right, well, let's keep reading, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time, and I didn't get to where I want to go, but I'll, maybe next time I'll... Revelation 17 and 12. Mm -hmm. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, mm -hmm. which have received no kingdom as yet. All right. Now, see, now they haven't, re now, this is AD 96. They haven't received a king, kingdom as of yet. See, but we. But receive power as kings one hour with the beast. But receive power as king one hour with the beast. See, all right. Now, a lot of people used to think that they were. Countries, you know, I remember back in high school, this guy was the name Al Lindsay. He wrote this book, The Late Great Planet Earth. I remember reading it, and, and they were speculating at the time that the European Union was these ten countries, you know, because at the time there wasn't that many countries in the European Union. Well. Yeah, but now it's like more than twenty-two. I mean, you know, it's like so. I can't be talking about that now. What I did, <clears throat> what I did was sit down and looked at society as a whole, and see, and, and noting the rise of multinationals and corporations, and, and the fact that the corporations are, are considered to be a person, see. So I, so I came up with this, not me, but I felt Yahweh showed this to me, because I looked at society and saw how society was divided up into these different parts, see, and these ten, ten kingdoms, See, are like the ten toes up here on Nebuchadnezzar's dream. See, because from a natural standpoint, your toes is what prop you, is what prop you up. If you didn't have any toes, you really couldn't walk. See, it's this, this your toes that prop you up. And it's the same way here. It's these kingdoms that prop up 
the beast. Okay? Keep reading. 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Mm -hmm. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Mm -hmm. For he is the mighty ruler of kings, and they are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Mm -hmm. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest were the whore sitteth mm -hmm. are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast these shall hate the whore mm -hmm. and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire mm -hmm. for Yahweh hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of Yahweh shall be fulfilled. Okay. In other words, Satan's kingdom divided against itself. All right? So now, um, how much time I got? Since you're there, turn the page and uh, let's see, get 18 and 10. Revelations 18 and 10. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment. Stop, stop at nine. What that say? Eighteen and nine. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her mm -hmm. shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Mm -hmm. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, mm -hmm. and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, mm -hmm. for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Read. The merchandise of gold and silver and mm -hmm. precious stones. Now everything, now, everything she's reading, you can find a category up for right here. You find a category for everything she's reading. Go ahead. And, per, and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all tiam wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and a, of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep Mm -hmm. and horses, mm -hmm. and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. And souls of men. See, all of these things are commodities. All of these are merchandising, see. Even souls of men, see, to be bought, traded, bartered for, you know. That's, it happens every day. It happens every day, all right, through ideas, and that concepts and stuff, people buy, you know, Satan says, I sell you a lie, or I'll sell you a concept, you buy it. Okay? Alright? Now, that's how the world is structured. Now, Satan's kingdom is divided against itself. They're, they're a major force. Dr. Kinley described them in his textbook. But right now, I want to get to this one. And I want to get to why I have time and maybe I don't want to. Maybe I could, we'll go over a little bit, but I'll try not to be, you know, too, too overbearing. Here, here's England, Great, Great Britain. Maybe I should be more specific because this is England, Scotland, and Ireland. The British Isles, Great Britain. Okay. Now here it has the word wife here. All right. Up here it has husband. See, now England, it's the reason why England is on here, in part, because England used to be part of the Roman Empire. It was right. the furthest western extent of the Roman Empire. If you ever this, see this line right here, I think this line is right here. This yellow line goes right here. That's, that, that separates Scotland and England, and, and I believe this is where Hadrian's Wall is at, Emperor Hadrian of the Roman Empire. This is where he built this wall here, you know, to separate civilized Roman England from the uncivilized Celtic, you know, peoples here, all right? But that's what's the furthest western, extent, the furthest extent of the Roman Empire. And so America, and see, see, see England in time became uh, the British Empire, see? <clears throat> when, we, when we talk about, boy, 
History, we say this. History, we've always told you, is three, different, is three parts to it. You have ancient history, you have medieval history, or the Middle Ages, and you have the modern history. At the end of the modern, at the end of the medieval time and the beginning of the modern age, ages, you have what historians call the age of exploration. That is to say, people from Europe, particularly the Portuguese, began to sail the oceans, you know, more and more, and try to find different places to go. Probably the most famous Portuguese story is, is the story of Ferdinand Magellan. Ferdinand Magellan was the one who, uh, who, who set out to prove that, it, that you could circumnavigate the world. He didn't really have the maps to show it, but he had I don't, something that he felt that, that you know, he said, if I go far enough, I'm sure there's a passage. There's a passage that will get me around these, these continents. Because see, they didn't, see, not till Columbus, you know, came along, you know, I mean, there were other folks that came before Columbus, but it was Columbus's journey that, that caused that extensive continuation of Europeans coming into the Western Hemisphere. And they began to realize, oh no, this is not China, this is this, these big continents blocking the way. So they were trying to always try to find a way out of it in, in the North, like with England, they would always try to go north because they were trying to find what, what they call the fabled Northwest Passage. That is to say, through the Arctic, some kind of way to, to get around that, to get to China. Because that's where all the goods was at, you know, the spices and all the stuff they want. And the other folks, like the Portuguese, would go south to try to find, you know, a way around um, that way. And he did. I can find the map here. Uh, this little map here. All right. And yeah, he did. See, from Portugal, from Portugal here, he sailed down and then went down here to the end of South America, which is called Tierra del Fuego, is what they call it, as we named it that. And they found, and they did, it's rough, but they found the passage that, that came out and went, you know, into the Pacific, which is a lot calmer, you know, ca calmer waters than the Atlantic, but it's also a bigger ocean. And so they had to sail across that, and they did they tend to start the death until they came to the other side, to these two Lakaka Islands over here. This is where, Magellan got killed, and, and, some, and, and many of them, you know, didn't survive the trip. You know, it took like three years for them to go all the way around here, go across the Pacific. They stopped in the islands, loaded up, and they came, sailed back around Africa, and then came back to Portugal. But then, but they showed that it was possible, and they circumnavigated the world. So other people, map makers, started, you know, going upon, you know, the stuff that the Portuguese were you know, had, uh, had, had laid out. And even the uh, America, a lot of people don't, don't, don't realize, but the name America is named after a very famous map maker. His name was Americo Vespucci. And he was a very famous map maker. And that's where the name America comes from, from, from this guy. He was a, he, I don't think he even been to this continent. But because of the, you know, but he was an explorer. But, but from what he heard from other folks and stuff, he was able to, you know, write, you know, draw maps based on their calculations. Because they had sextants and stuff, and, you know, and they would make readings and whatnot. And, you know, yeah. So Amerigo Vespucci was the one who kind of came up with the map for what we understand, the North American, the Americas, right, of, of which they're named after, named after him. Okay, now. In saying that, the Spanish and the Portuguese, particularly the Spanish, in the New World, what they call the New World, the North and South American continent, they had the biggest influence or influence, okay? And as I just showed you, you know, they found uh, it was the Spanish, what they call the conquistadors, who, you know, who came across uh, the Aztec civilizations, you know, like Cortez or the Inca civilization, you know, like Pizarro, you know, where they had gold, in which they plundered. And they took that gold for the church. 
See, let's, let's get that straight. For the church, the church did this. I'm talking about the, the, vet, the back of the poor. Right. See, they, they divided the world in half. Maybe we can find out if we can read that. Uh, you know, I do. Okay. Line of demarcation. See, where, where they, divided the, they divided the world in half. And see, and so the, the Pope and the, the Pope divided the world in half and gave one part to Portugal and gave one part to Spain, meaning any new lands on either side of the line, you know, were going either to Spain or Portugal. It's the reason why in South America, Brazil speaks Portuguese. <coughs> and the rest of South America and Central America speak Spanish. You got it? Um, they said about the treaty. Treaty of Torres, yes. Do you want me to read that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Put your microphone. This is from uh, nationalgeographic.org. On June 7th, 1494, the governments of Spain and Portugal agreed to the Treaty of Tordesillas, named for the city in Spain in which it was created. The Treaty of Tordesillas neatly divided the New World of the Americas between the two superpowers. Spain and Portugal divided the New World by drawing a north-to-south line of demarcation in the Atlantic Ocean about 100 leagues or 555 kilometers or 345 miles mm -hmm. west of the Cape Verde Islands, off the coast of northwestern Africa, then controlled by Portugal. Mm -hmm. All lands east of that line, about 46 degrees, 37 minutes west, were claimed by Portugal. All lands west of that line were claimed by Spain. Spain and Portugal adhered to the treaty without major conflict between the two, although the line of demarcation was moved an additional 270 leagues, about 1,500 kilometers, or 932 miles, farther west in 1506, okay. which, enabled Portugal, mm -hmm. which enabled Portugal to claim the eastern coast of what is now Brazil. All right. That's, that's the reason why Brazil speaks Portuguese. All right. and because of the Pope. The Pope was the one who declared this. You see, who was it? It was Alexander the Sixth. Whose, whose real name was Rodrigo Borgia. Oh. He was the first Spanish pope, okay? But he was the one who declared that. So in the, in the Americas, as far as from Mexico on down, the Portuguese and the Spanish, but most particularly Spanish, pretty much had control. Whereas in the north, you had the English colonies. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> you had privateers. You know, you could read about them. One of my favorite stories to read is this guy named Francis Drake who was a privateer for the English, and he, was, he worked for the English, and he set about to rob the Spanish you know, ships, plundering, piracy, legal piracy, because he was authorized by the Queen of England to do so, Elizabeth the I. So now, and really, it, and, and what he did, you know, oh, this was one of the greatest, I, I, I think this is one of the greatest acts of piracy I, I've ever read. This guy, Francis Drake, let me show you something here. What he did, see, we told you that, the, that, the, that Spain, see, Spain had colonies on the western coast of, of South America and in Mexico because of the Incas and the Aztecs and stuff. But see, but nobody knew Magellan's passage except the Spanish, see, and the Portuguese. But one day, Francis Drake robbed a Spanish ship and found maps that had passage through the states of, you know, you know, the Straits of Miguel, yeah, it's called the Straits of Miguel, down in the Tierra del Fuego, and see how to, how to get through there. So what he did was, he, he navigated through there, and he hit, he hit all those cities, you know, on the western coast, because they didn't expect that. They didn't expect to see, the Spanish did not expect to see an English frigate in the Pacific Ocean on the western shore, but when they, they was like, yeah, this is cool, because nobody knows how to get here but us. But here's this English there's only one ship, and he's hitting all these coasts. And so they're like saying, okay, well, he hit us. He's got to come back around to the space to come back if he wants to go back to England. Mm -hmm. and, say, and, and Drake said, you know, and, and they, he, they realized that. They even told him, they said, that we waiting for us at the space. They said, well, this is what we'll do. We'll circumnavigate them. In other words, they went around the world on them. 
went around the world and, and see. And they didn't have no radar and no GPS to, to track these folks, all right? So they went around. It took him two years to get back there, but then he, he had the maps where he found these different islands because there was like four or five ships and he loaded them up and it came back. The England, you know, I mean, he was, the man was made. He was a millionaire. I mean, gave a lot of it to the queen, and, and she knighted him, made him Sir Francis Drake, made him head of the Admiralty because the Spanish got mad at this, and they declared war yeah. on England. Spanish. See, if you ever read about it, Google the, Google the, the, the Spanish Armada, where they sent hundreds of warships, you know, to invade England. And because of a storm and the seamanship of Sir Francis Drake, England was able to rule the day, and they took over as a global power after that battle. And that laid the foundation. See, this was Queen Elizabeth I. And see, she was the daughter of Henry VIII. Henry VIII, see, we said here, this was the wife, this was the husband. Henry VIII, her father, divorced England from the Roman Catholic Church. Right. See, and he created the Church of England, of which the king or queen was the head of the church. See? In other words, a king and a high priest, yeah. technically. All right? And so Elizabeth, her, his daughter, when she came to power, set the England on a course toward Protestancy, as far as, you know, not being Roman Catholic, you know, but Protestants. Whereas Spain was a Roman Catholic country. England defeated Spain. England took over as a global power to set the stage and the beginning for the British Empire, see, all right? And they ruled the world, all right? America is a breakaway colony right. of the British Empire, the, 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 the so-called the 13 colony. They broke away, you know, from the British Empire, had a war over it, okay? Now, England, before this, this, this war is happening, see, they had their, their thoughts about Governments and other people had their thoughts of government like, you know, I was going to have something red. I don't know if I got enough time because we're almost out of time, but maybe maybe I can get into it next week, you know, but but see Democracy see it comes from Greece the Republic See which is Rome see it we, we get it from Rome and the Senate But they in turn got it from the Greeks mm -hmm. because it was let's see maybe I could maybe I could be a little bit Yeah, it's, I, I bought that book at a yard sale in my neighborhood. It was really good. It's got a lot of really good stuff there. One of Socrates' students was Plato, mm -hmm. considered by many of the greatest philosopher of Western civilization. Unlike his master Socrates, who did not write down his thoughts, Plato wrote a great deal. He set out his ideas of government in his work entitled The Republic. I said, that, that, that's... That's, that's Plato. He wrote the Republic, from which the Romans got their idea for the Republic from. Okay? Go ahead. Based on his experience in Athens, Plato had come to distrust the workings of democracy. It was obvious to him that individuals could not achieve a good life unless they lived in a just and rational state. Plato's search for the just state led him to construct an ideal state in which people were divided into three basic groups. At the top was an upper class of philosopher kings, unless either philosophers become kings in their countries or those who are now called kings and rulers come to be sufficiently inspired with a genuine desire for wisdom. Unless that 
it is to say, political power and philosophy meet together. There can be no rest from troubles for states nor for all mankind. The second group in Plato's ideal were those who showed courage. They would be the warriors who protected society. All the rest made up of the, mass, the masses, who were people driven not by wisdom or courage, but by desire. They would be the producers of society, the artisans, tradespeople, and farmers. Contrary to common Greek custom, Plato also believed that men and women should have the same education and equal access to all positions. Plato established a school at Athens known as the Academy. One of his pupils who studied there for 20 years was Aristotle. Aristotle's interest lay in analyzing and classifying things based on observation and investigation. His interests were wide-ranging. He wrote works on an enormous number of subjects, including ethics, logic, politics, poetry, astronomy, geology, biology, and physics. Until the 17th century, science in the Western world remained largely based on Aristotle's thinking. I see, now that's, <clears throat> Aristotle, I mean, he, he wrote about politics, but he was terrible at science. Because, see, if you remember, Galileo was the one who invented the telescope that challenged Aristotle's idea that the Earth was the center of the universe. See, whereas Galileo challenged that, you know, and the church, the Roman Catholic Church, was behind, they, they was behind Aristotle. And they said, yeah, well, we believe that too. See, so Galileo, you know, showed that it wasn't. See? Right. So this enters into what they call the age of reasoning, that is a man thinking, what they call the age of enlightenment here. See, that's where England is in fact. See, see, because they draw from the people in the past. Plato, Socrates, Western civilization draws heavily upon the Greek tradition. Okay, keep reading, finish up. So, Like Plato, Aristotle wanted an effective form of government mm -hmm. that would rationally direct human affairs. Unlike Plato, he did not seek an ideal state, but tried to find the best form of government by analyzing existing governments. For his politics, Aristotle looked at the constitutions of 158 states and found three good forms of government. Monarchy, aristocracy, aristocracy, and constitutional government. Based on his examination, however, he warned that monarchy can easily turn into tyranny aristocracy into oligarchy. oligarchy and constitutional government into radical democracy or anarchy. He favored constitutional government as the best form for most people. The civilization of the ancient Greeks was the principal source of Western culture. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle established the foundations of Western philosophy. Western literature forms are largely derived from Greek poetry and drama. The Greek notions of harmony, pr proportion, and beauty have remained the touchstones for all subsequent Western art and architecture. A rational method of inquiry so important to modern science, we conceive in ancient Greece that many political terms are Greek in origin. So our concepts of the rights and duties of citizenship, especially as they were conceived in Athens, the first great democracy the world had seen. Okay. Uh, let's give some terms there. Uh, that's okay. We're out of time. All right. Now, that's it. That's now Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Ben Franklin, they read Plato. They read Aristotle. They read Socrates. Mm. See, and that's why they came up with the government that they did because they went and we just read that Aristotle said he looked at all these different governments and saw, well, a constitutional government seems to be the best. So that's, that's what Thomas Jefferson and George Washington said. Mm. They looked and they read and said, you know, maybe Aristotle might be right. Let's, let's try a constitutional yeah. government. And the Romans, they have a republic here. 
And they got to sit it. Well, let's, 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 let's take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We'll take a little bit of the other, and we'll see what we can come up with. We'll come up with a better, you know, a better mousetrap or something. Yeah. You know? that's, that's what they did. And that's why America is like the way it is. Because I've heard of people will say that America is like the new covenant or something like that. That is, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. That is the biggest set of nonsense I've ever heard. And if you don't like it, you can call me up and, and, it, and it convince me why. And, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull this chart out. And I'm going to show you America on this, on this chart up here. Because America is the culmination of everything that you see up, to, up here. See? And they, and they do the same thing that they did. Yeah, they got a republic. They got democracy. But guess what? They had slavery. Right. Just like these countries had slavery. They had slavery here. And, and here's something else a lot of people don't want to think about. America still has slavery. Right. Yeah, we still have slavery. How many people are in prison? Can somebody give me a number? Nationwide? How many people are in prison nationwide? Like two, maybe three, billion, three million people? Right. Two million people? Those are slaves. Oh, we just don't call them slaves. We call them convicts. You know? and, and, and the reason why we call them convicts instead of slaves because the white people didn't like that term. Because it's in the 13th Amendment. If you go to prison, you are a slave. And they said, well, I ain't no slave. But I ain't no Negro. And I was like, okay, well, we'll come up with another term. We'll, we'll call you a convict. <laughs> okay? That, but, but it's the same thing. All you got to do is read the 13th Amendment. Anytime you go to prison in this country, you, you lose all your rights. Right. You have, you have effectively become a slave. See, that's true. So, so oh, I ain't no slave. Yeah, but, and guess what? Why do you think those people go to the, the prisons to get you know the cheap labor? You know, <laughs> why, why do you think it's, it's like that? See, because they can't. They, they, they don't have any rights. They're slaves, really. But we just call them convict or convict labor. Because remember back in the days they used to have the chain gangs yeah. and stuff. You know, <laughs> out there working on the road and whatnot. Oh, man. Who are you trying to kid? And see, look. And they say, well, we have freedom of religion, freedom of speech. And stuff. They had that in the Roman Empire. I'm talking about pagan Rome. They, they had freedom of speech. They had freedom. They had freedom of religion in, in, the, in the Roman Empire. Only one caveat. You can believe in any god, religion you want, but you had to do one thing. You had to offer a sacrifice to the emperor and pledge allegiance. See? And it's no different in America. In America, you can believe in any religion you want, but, they, but, but, but at school they'll make you say, get over here, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the United States. They make you do that. At least they did us, but we were going. Not so much anymore, but when we were going to school, they, they, you had to do that every day. You had to you know, get up, face the flag, and you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And all this. Not realizing that it goes all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar, because that's what because the any time Nebuchadnezzar, like when he played the national anthem, he had a he had a ninety foot gold statue of himself of himself. So when you heard the national anthem played in Babylon, you were like, oh wait, a national anthem playing? Where's the statue? Oh, it's always that way. Then you had to get down and genuflect toward that that statue. And it's just the same. It's still different. People stay here, hear the national anthem, you know, like, you know, salute or whatever. All of this comes from back here. Human government, you know, the way, you know, look, you know, uh, human government, see, imitates Yahweh. See, that's what human, human government is, is, is the Satan's way of trying to imitate right. the law of the spirit of life. See, when the true governing agent is the Holy Spirit in you. Right. See, now if the Holy Spirit in you can't govern you, then nothing can. I mean, sure, they got laws and stuff, and, you know, Here's something Dr. Kennedy once said, and I know I'm over time, but I'll, I'll, I'll conclude. Dr. Kennedy once made a, he, he, made a, he gave a parable once, and he told a story of a man who just kept cussing. And he just kept cussing, you know? And, uh, and he was in the courtroom, and he was cussing, and the, and the judge said, now, you know, look, you know, you're in the court of law, you know, I'm going to have to fine you, you know, for contempt of court. And this was back in the 50s, early 60s, I guess, when this happened. And so I'm going to fine you $25. Well, the guy was a millionaire. Yeah. All right, so he said, I said, oh, man, that's, shoot, that's chicken feed, man. I'll pay my $25 here. Yeah. And, and furthermore, blank, 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 blank. And the judge said, $25 more. And the guy just said, that's all right. 
I keep going. Blankety, 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 blankety. See, and it just kept going until the court closed. And I don't know how much money he spent, but he could afford it. And you know, but see, but it didn't stop him. Now, maybe to me and you, you know, because you know, you know, it's like if I was cussing too much and I had a spouse that wanted me to stop cussing, I'd say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll stick five dollars in the jar every time I say a cuss word or something. Now, if I'm a poor person. That might work with me yeah. to a certain point because I because I I I, I, was like, I can't I can't afford this I can't you know but if you're a billionaire you know you got some money you know you be like oh man that ain't chicken that's chicken feet you don't want me to cut in here I, you know I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay for my right to say what I'm gonna say you know that kind of thing see so that really didn't work you know and so the thing is that, that he was trying to impress upon us is that it's the law of the spirit of life that's in you. We call the Holy Spirit. Who is Yahshua? See, that controls everything. See, that controls you. See, everything that you're doing and everything that you're about is under his control. Okay? One more scripture and I'm done. Philippians 3 and 20. Philippians 3 and 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, mm -hmm. from whence also we are expecting our Savior, King Yahshua, the Messiah. Now, see, now, our citizenship is in heaven. See, in other words, we're just, we're just sojourners here. Mm -hmm. Sure, you know, I will say that I got a passport. And, you know, that says that, you know, I'm an American citizen when I go somewhere. And, and believe me, I will, you have to use it if you're traveling or something like that. And I mean, you just got to deal with it. And Dr. Kinley even said, look, we will obey the laws of man as long as it does not interfere with our right to worship Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. But see, we're just sojourners here. This is a fourth, because see, this is just the fourth age out of seven. We've got three days journey to go. See, we're just sojourners here. You know, I, I see, but because our true citizenship is in heaven, just like you know, the Israel, they were sojourners in Egypt, but their true citizenship was the promised land. Right. See, which is where they were born. And that's the same way with us. Continue. Who shall change our vile body, mm -hmm. that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, mm -hmm. according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Okay. Now... That's our true citizenship. Because we're just sojourners here, see, and we're just going on until the time comes, you know, where all, where, where everything is come back into Yahweh, He is all in all, and we in Him, we can look back and see and understand why Yahweh even made a creation in the first place, why He made a man. You know, all questions will be answered, see, because you will be the answer. You will be Elohim in totality, in completeness. As of right now, we have this in part, not in totality, but we have the promise that we will be immortally glorified and that we will be in Yahshua the Messiah for the next set of ages to come. All right? I hope you were edified by this. We go. Hopefully that we can continue some of this next week. Uh, as always, be safe, be healthy, but most of all, be in Yahshua the Messiah. Why? Because he most surely is your only hope of glory. And with those few words, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All righty, thank you for that. That concludes today's lectures. Uh, we invite anybody who wants to come over. We have a couple of seats here. Can't really fit everybody here, but we'll accommodate you. Uh, bring your questions, you know. Uh, we go through it, you know, polytechnically. Okay, so let's all stand be dismissed. Ask for that to come up and uh, say doxology. I'll be reading the doxology from the last two verses of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise, Elohim, 
our Savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here, oh. I forgot to mention that uh, Kenway's not here today, but we miss her, and hopefully she gets better. Okay, uh, hopefully see her next week. Okay, that's it.